Enga iwi, enga mana, enga waka, enga hoe fa hairi mai, hairi mai, hairi mai. Rau renga tira ma tenda koutou, ka nui ta hari, ko ai hara mai nau koutou katoa. Tenda koutou, tenda koutou, tenda rā katoa, uh, uh, ka, uh, tenda rā koutou katoa. Uh, kia ora, kia ora nā, mālau e lelei, talo fa lava, uh, salam alaikum, namaste and welcome every one of you joining us here on the, uh, either on the webinar, or also on the Facebook Live on the Greenwood Speaker site and the Waitakari Ethnic Board site. Great to have your company here this morning as we go live with the final episode in our Moments That Matter series brought to you by the Waitakari Ethnic Board with the very kind support of Foundation North and the uh, Aotearoa Academy. Um, it's been a pleasure bringing you these presentations over the course of this last six-week period. Uh, the whole process of this was to bring to the ethnic and migrant community uh, from Waitakere all the way up to Northland and further afield, uh, a series that talked around mindset, that talked about resilience and wellness, well-being, kindness, and all of the elements that give us the opportunity to thrive and survive throughout this COVID period. It has been an extremely challenging year in so many different ways. And Along with those challenges, of course, uh, we've had some wonderful moments and some wonderful successes uh, individually in our social groups, in our communities. And it's a real celebration, this whole process of what we're doing here. And so what we're attempting to do, and we're certainly hoping that it is of benefit, is to bring various different viewpoints from a range of speakers from different communities, all of them with an immigrant base. And that's a, a really big thing. I personally, I'm an immigrant as well, uh, arriving into this country in 1972, admittedly from uh, an English-speaking country, in fact, England, uh, the UK coming out here, um, uh, but transporting a whole family from one country to another country and then having to make it, I think, is a pretty much a standard thing that we have for all of our communities that we are attempting to touch with this particular show. So I think we can all take heart that the stories and the experiences and the, the information that we've shared over the course of the six weeks uh, is rooted in uh, our own communities and has an opportunity to be able to increase our success and our sense of community, the sense of being able to travel through this world uh, with a little bit more resilience, even if it's just a touch, with all of the information that we've shared. And because it's come from different viewpoints as well, it gives us another angle. We tend to go through life with the own experiences we have. And if we don't search further afield, it can be quite insular. We can be just going one line. And to have innovation, one of the cornerstones of innovation is to have multiple sources of inspiration. And that is really what we hope we've been for you over the course of this last six weeks. Today is no exception. We have joining us here online very, very shortly indeed, my next and final guest for the series, and that is Steffi August. Um, who joins us coming in from East Germany. So if you know anything about the uh, elements of Germany after the Second World War, it was divided into various different areas. And uh, East Germany was very swiftly walled off uh, as the Soviets took over that particular um, section of the country. Uh, for many, many years until the late 80s, this was a, pretty much a no-go zone. Steffi lived behind that wall. And I am really keen to find out more about her experiences and of course the whole immigrant experience about coming here to New Zealand, the challenges that are involved in that and how she overcame them and interestingly what she's doing now as a speaker in the community working within the corrections service uh, and I'm fascinated with some of the wonderful success that she's had um, and interested in delving into exactly how she's achieved that and how she's using mindset uh, to turn people's lives around within the prison service, but also out in the community with our, uh, with our wonderful range of uh, different social groups too. So without any further ado, let us move through and welcome Steffi August here to our space. Steffi, nice to have you on. How are you doing? Hello, good morning. Great, great introduction. Thank you. It was awesome. You're very I'm welcome. Fine. You're very welcome indeed. Um, and it's really great to have you here. Uh, Germany. In a, well, West Germany in particular, is, has a great affinity for me. I spent uh, a fair amount of time there. I lived in Germany, South Germany mainly, for roughly nine months. 
I, and, and during that time, I managed to pick up just a little bit of language, um, as we tend to do. That's what we do when we live in different parts of the world, isn't it? With different countries. Um, I'm really interested from your perspective because you you speak really good English, uh, which is brilliant. Did Thank that you. happen in school uh, in East Germany, or was it um, or, or was it German and uh, Russian? Yes, we were taught Russian for six years every day, and we had school six days a week. So every day for six days a week, we had one hour Russian. And I still can speak and write. <laughs> it's it's still, it's like in here. It is, you will never forget this. <laughs> yes, no, that was yeah, Russian, German, and Russian. But Russian was a must. So that's so living and growing up in that particular uh, uh, environment must have been particularly challenging. But I'm interested in this because your experience would be that's your experience. You are you don't have any other experience outside of the place that you live in. Uh, but but what what was it like? And I'm going to couch this in. I've got some friends who grew up and lived in Poland, and their experience maybe mirrored yours. But it was the process of queuing uh, and queuing up outside of shops for nothing. Essentially, there's nothing left in the shops. Giant queue. So I mean, I, I don't want to yeah, talk for you. Tell us what it was like growing up in those early formative years in East Germany. Uh, what I say actually now is it is amazing that 40 years they could have a country under control. We were dictated and monitored for 40 years. That's fascinating, you know, to do this. But I, I really would like to you imagine living in a country like where prices don't go up. You have free daycare, free childcare, you have free education, free healthcare, everything is free, hardly any unemployment, there hardly any crime rate. That sounds amazing, you know, <laughs> but no such country exists, not anymore. But this is where I was born and I was actually made in East Germany, like you said before. And because you didn't know the difference, this is what it was your life. Everything was dictated, monitored. And like you just mentioned, when something, a queue was outside a shop, oh my goodness, as a kid, I so remember we walking past the veggie shop and we could see a queue already from the from the far. So, oh God, we have to wait there and see what we can get today. You had no idea what it was, but it was something special. Great. And so one, one, one really that was so, so we were, and I love bananas. I still love bananas. I still remember as a kid, we walked past and people come out with bananas. Oh my goodness, what is this? I want this. So they came out with the bananas, one kilo per person. So one kilo, it's maybe five or six uh, bananas and say, mom, come on. We go back in the queue and we buy another kilo. It wasn't a good idea. <laughs> Finally, you, you went, Hunter, you already had one kilo mm. and you walked out. Even yogurt, yogurt, take only four. Yogurt, tomato sauce, gherkins, it was all measured for you. You were a dictator, really, like puppets. So that's a. a... A, a tough experience, and we're laughing about this now. I mean, we, you know, it's it's because it sounds ludicrous and and those challenging yeah. times. Um, and certainly, how, how old were you when you? Uh, we'll get to how you got out of East Germany, but how old were you when you when you came out of Germany? We left in nineteen eighty eight. I was twenty four. Wow. Twenty four, so, and S Sally was four years old. It was on her birthday, but it was my daughter's birthday, but it was on purpose. They did on purpose to let, so we had to go on her birthday to yep. make it even more complicated for grandmas. So the fun. the environment that it was um, that you grew up in was it was there a it was a, it was a sense of foreboding, li like living in there was there was there potential? Did you have to make sure you towed the line that that you did everything right? 
Uh, otherwise, um, things may not go well for you. Yeah, yeah. You really like what I said before. It is really you. You were dictated control. You live like a puppet. Yes, you were dictated, and you. We didn't have a voice at all. And what I, what I want to say also, we we lived in fear of being randomly arrested while meeting up with our friends on a regular basis. Your fear everywhere on Stasi, I guess everybody knows Stasi, it's like a mafia from the government and they were everywhere. They were absolutely everywhere. We had microphones in our car, in our flat. People went through our flat while we were out. It's, Controlled it, all the time. It's difficult living here in New Zealand to comprehend that level of, uh, of, of state intrusion into your life and yeah. that, it, that it is commonplace, that that is how you live, that is, that is the expectation of how you grow up, which it must be very difficult for raising children in this environment because children tend to speak, don't they? <laughs> so, that's right, that, the, that's right. And I, I, but at school, honestly, we, like when we started school, you start school at six, you have a super tutor, you know, a big, big coat. Uh, going on over there in September when you start school, everybody is six years old. It is it is great, and it was all like the dictation was in some kind was nice because you go to the crash, you go to kindergarten, and then you go to school. So it was all organized for you. There was no dropouts or unemployment or you're not going to school. No way, you know that you really had to go. It was like an army camp. This Dresden, where we, where I was brought up, and for years, you know, in the morning when the teacher arrives in the classroom, everybody stand up, and then goes, "For freedom, not just let's my side behind them. Am I right? You know, you have to do this, and you have to be strict. And then you could sit. It's like everything was like in an army boot camp. Everything, even when you we got older, we are fourteen, fifteen years old, mm. and then we didn't say, we didn't do this one. Then he says, Freundschaft, so friendship. So the, the teacher comes in, friendship, friendship, sit. That's how it I go somewhere, the Germans, I give orders, but I take orders as well. <laughs> <laughs> now, you just, you just mentioned um, Dresden. Uh, because this is the the city that um, you grew up in, and for our audience uh, who may remember their uh, world history or have studied world history, we'll know that uh, Dresden was significantly bombed uh, towards the end of the, well, very at the very end of the Second World War by, by the by the Allies, and of course that in itself uh, caused significant challenges for that city and also its inhabitants and a, and a massive loss of life. Uh, but you would have seen the city in, in its rebuilding phases, I'm sure, yeah. as, as you were yes. uh, growing up. Can you tell us a little bit about your experiences in Dresden? Yes. So it's, a, it's like I say, it's a really old city, but amazing churches, old churches. And we had a chat beforehand, and I so remember the story from my mom, because my mom was two years old. was totally bombed out, totally. But lots of people went there to actually to be safe because the bombs were coming, the, the, the airplanes were coming, the jet was coming, coming into trace them. So that was the only place where they actually could go. And lots of people made it to the cellar and some not, unfortunately. So my mum, with her mum, with my grandma, they make it to the cellar and mum had a, a doll with her. I hope I'm not getting emotional. And they were safe in there. And how she describes it, the sound, she will never, ever forget. My mum cannot fly. She cannot go in an airplane. She will never, ever come and visit me in New Zealand. She, as soon as she sees an airplane, she, the noise, everything, she is still, she's actually freaking out. I have to say this. She cannot. Even my son is a commercial pilot, but no, she 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 actually can't. So 
And once uh, the bombing was over and they actually could get out, no idea what to expect, and she lost. Say to you, my my grandpa. He was a teacher, and he wrote a poem, and I would love to translate. Oh, I have some to translate this poem. The feelings in there. This is you can you actually relive this moment as a two year old losing your doll, you know, and the son. Oh, look at me! I'm getting emotional again. No, but um, they did lots of rebuilding. We had very interesting roadworks. We had the copper. No, couple. <laughs> there was no no concrete, no asphalt. Totally different. But the entire place, so there's approximately 500,000 people live there. It's a beautiful city on the River Elba. There is a, a bridge, maybe you heard about it, the Blaue Wunder. This is very, yeah, it's, and it is still blue. It's the, the reason it's called Blue, blue Wonder, it, because it is a blue bridge. That is still, but they have done heaps, heaps, especially with the Frauenkirche. Yes. The Frauenkirche, I guess some of some people maybe been in Dresden and have seen this. Can, can you just describe uh, or tell us? Uh, obviously, uh, Frauenkirche is it's a church, yeah. but, but but can you tell us what what that means for our audience who uh, perhaps German is not their first language? <laughs> yeah, that was that was the biggest the bigger church in the middle of Dresden beautiful like you call it like in russia you know we have like onions as a roof beautiful huge huge but like i said it was destroyed on the last day of second world war and over the years it was rebuilt but it cost so much money so they started something really special that people could donate money to the church and they block and this is what my, my other grandma did my other grandma she bought a concrete block and we know exactly where it is so when i've been addressed and my mom said hey this is grandma's concrete block <laughs> so she donated and the church if somebody goes to dress and one day we can fly again go it's worth to see it it's beautiful absolutely beautiful and all the old castles around as well this is yeah you have to see it, to be honest. You have to see it. Oh, you describe it so beautifully. I, I really do want to see it. Some of the architecture throughout Germany is phenomenal. Uh, you know, the things that were saved um, after the Second World War. Uh, and also the architecture that's been built since the Second World War as well. There's some, some amazing stuff there. But the whole process, I'm just get, getting back to this particular session that we're doing, which is the Moments That Matter session for the Waitakere Ethnic Board. And we were talking around elements of COVID, and you mentioned family overseas. I mean, this is one of the biggest challenges that we've seen or when we first started the series where we asked the, uh, a lot of our, um, our target audience to say what were some of the challenges that we had. And, and one of the biggest things was this inability to connect with family uh, who are overseas. And the, and the fact is we are unlikely to be able to fly for a significant period of time. How has that affected you and, and your family? I think thanks to technology, thanks to technology, so everything is possible. Mum rings me every week, tells me all the latest stuff. We actually don't know really what's going on overseas. I talked to my partner the other day and the things he's telling me, he said, you know what, East Germany is coming back. The situation over there, strikes, demonstrations, Mm -hmm. It's, yeah, the East Germany is in the making again. There is, it, it is crazy when you really think about it, because when, before we left to West Germany, there's, I always say, it's like, describe it as a pot. The water is boiling and it's boiling and boiling, but then it's boiling so much, the lid is falling off and they had to open the, the wall, you know, the boundaries. So, yes. And this, and this and this is actually at the moment over there. So I, what I say, I appreciate being here and I made the move. And what you said before, Greg, it is our lives are full of challenges. But if we know how to see them as, as an opportunity, that makes life much, much easier. And so many people say, oh, I'm happy when 2020 is over. 
But to be honest, reflect. What did do you take out of 2020? What new opportunities did you have? When we had the four weeks lockdown, that was for me, it was runners and bikers paradise. I have to be honest. Bike rides at nighttime and smelling homemade food everywhere. Seeing families out there during the day biking, reconnecting with families. This brought families together. Some maybe not, but most of them brought them together. And, and, th and this is what, what counts. So COVID is not all like bad. You know what I mean? Yes, I do. I mean, there have certainly been some positives. And I recall right at the start of the lockdown process uh, when we had uh, these, what was actually as much as a challenge from a, from a business standpoint and a, and a financial standpoint, because, you know, obviously work's gone. The, 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 what are we yeah. going to do? The ability to slow down was actually yeah. something that uh, that was a positive that came out of it. The ability to reconnect with family mm -hmm. uh, was another positive that I, I certainly took from that as well. You have to sort of mitigate that with the fact that in the background, uh, you know, you're still thinking, okay, so where's the work? Where's the opportunities? Where, where, how can we uh, make our way through this process? But yes, taking and uh, looking at things from a positive um, state of mind uh, rather than a, uh, a negative state of mind is definitely the right way to go about any kind of situation, um, you know, any, any kind of challenge that you are faced with. And you were faced in East Germany with some significant challenges, uh, particularly how to get out of East yeah. Germany. And uh, you had a, a well, tell us about the um, escape attempts that um, you, uh, yes. you undertook. So how it, how, it actually, how it actually started is like, you know, we, re we realized there's something is not right and, Dresden, especially Dresden, we were actually sheltered. We, we couldn't listen to other radio stations or other TV channels. We were absolutely sheltered in Dresden, like this was behind the iron curtains. And then we decided, you know what, it's time for a change. We don't want to look like this. And we decided, like many others, to make the move to West Germany. But however, making this decision wasn't easy because it means we would lose contact with all family and friends once we are on the other side of the border. So we had to apply to local authorities to get permission to leave. But as soon as we did, we lost our jobs and we were put under secret surveillance by the Stasi, what I said before. We had microphones in our car, in our flat, but we didn't know in the beginning. And people went through our apartment all the time. So life was very challenging. But what I say, this was a challenge to fight, to grow, to be, to get stronger, because we knew we wanted to get out. And I love what I do with my coaching. We had the passion to get out. We believe we can get out. And we were determined that we can make it. And we there was, we were unstoppable. And this is the thing, Greg, if you put it out there, you focus on the outcome, not on the obstacles, You that makes you so strong, you can do anything in life, anything. So, so we waited for approximately, we waited for two years. And, and during this two years, every week on a Tuesday from three to six, the office was open, where you where we went every Tuesday to say we want to get out just to be seen to get a tick they yep. really want to get out consistency another thing consistency with everything in life right so we went to this office and then during the two years so we actually tried to escape three times twice right. we went to to Hungary Yep. Right to the embassy, and they said, "No, nah, we can't do anything. You have to go back." So that's what we did. Then uh, the third time, we uh, tried to actually jump in a boot of an embassy car because they were not checked. They could go to the check. And doors are boots, but since all the roads, or streets um, around the embassy were on the border 
was monitored, it was far too risky. We couldn't do it. We had a daughter in, in, in Dresden. We just could not do it. So the only chance was really to wait and fight. But we had friends of ours. He, so they tried to escape during night. He was already on the west side of Germany waiting for his wife to follow. Yep. But she was shot. So he went back and both went uh, into prison six floors under the main street in Dresden. Yep. We had no idea this secret prison existed. And a year later, West Germany emigrated to West Germany. Yep. There are so many tragic, honestly, tragic accidents. And if 100, 179 people lost their lives trying to escape. A, it is tough. A, a huge tragedy. I've got, I have to say. I mean, we're within, in in very recent memory as well. Uh, and as you say, you know, the conditions are uh, becoming ripe for a similar kind of um, situation. And, and it's definitely we, nobody wants to be going down that track. Um, but that process of uh, of coming out of uh, East Germany, um, I understand that, uh, and I know that that people can go back and find information about themselves based on what the Stasi knew about them at the time. And I understand that you have uh, your Stasi file, is that correct? Yeah, yeah. This is when you believe I was nobody. Say, you know, I was really not an important person. So you could, after years after, you could apply for your... Yeah, and when you look at this, just as an example, so we sent a letter to West Germany and they copied everything. So everything they could find about us, you know, even, even, every, every, honestly, and, that, and what they, but what they also did, they did in here, there are things, you, when I, when I got the file, wait a second, where is that? This is with black, so you can't actually read or they, who, it, who it was, who actually put you in the poo-poo. You know what I mean? So they've re redacted yeah. the the names of those who yes. uh, were the informers on names. you. Yeah. Where is it? Oh, like as an example here, you see the you know. So you don't know who who did it. I, we've got our suspicions who it yep. was. I want to say it, but yeah, but it doesn't matter. It, it's done. You know, it's like I don't live in the past. It is done. But I've got this and. Looking at it is that like, my goodness, we've been so strong and it made us even stronger to do this. So after this, the, the thing is great. I, I tell you, yep. uh, so the two years, so we tried to escape, nothing worked. So we really had to really fight and wait because till so they say, okay. So then after two years, we got um, a letter because there was no phone really. We didn't have phones in the house. You had to go to the phone box, you know, where it's cute, with the cues outside. And it was, everything was a mail. So then we got a letter we, to come to the special office again to get the final um, permission to leave. So once you had this, or your flat, you had to actually delete everything because we were nothing we were nobody anymore as soon as you applied to immigrate you are done honestly you are nothing so and then say so this was on the tuesday between three and six so you cannot do this in three hours that is no way so now you have a week hopefully in this week you can finish it and go back the next tuesday between three and six mm. if you are not in the queue by 12 o'clock because then you don't make it to six o'clock. You have to be there in order to get out. Honestly, that, that was- That's challenging. That was, yeah, so we went back and we filed everything. Everything was done. We got the check. Okay, and now this is the next thing. Now they had one day to three months to give you the permission to leave but you had to leave in 24 hours in a special provided train the following 
night. So you got the notice in your letterbox at 7.30 at night to leave the next day at 7 past 10 in a special provided train. So we did, once we have filed everything and we had the tick to leave, but we still waited for the last final tick, we actually moved in luggage every day to make sure everything was washed because you didn't know if you get the letter at night time. And like I say, one, one day to three months, when did we got it? The day, just the day before the three months ended. So for three months, you lived in the limbo and had no idea when is the day. You couldn't earn any money. You, you actually couldn't do anything because you think, oh my God, tonight is the night. We are leaving. You know, this is the power, the silent power. Yeah, absolutely. And and that's uh, well, it's actually one of the most insidious forms of power, isn't it? It's just withholding, withholding yeah. your rights, withholding your, your abilities to do things. I, I mean, you know, I'm, I'm mindful that our um, migrant and ethnic communities here in uh, from Waitakere and all throughout New Zealand uh, probably share similar stories in terms of the countries that they've come from or some of the challenges that have been involved. And, you know, coming to a, a new country is uh, is rife with challenge uh, because you you don't know necessarily what to expect um, when yeah. you get here. Um, I'm really interested. In, like, I, I'm getting the sense that all the way through this experience, these experiences are shaping you. They're shaping the Steffi who who's sitting here now, um, and using those skills that that you have now will have been born from these challenges and these hardships uh, and some of the you know the realistic the, the fact is the challenges that we experience depending on how we view them and how we tend to use them can be incredible forces for yeah. good and I'm, I'm really mindful that right now with COVID and some of the some of the situations that people find themselves in with resilience with willpower by changing mindset we can turn these experiences into positive learning experiences for future. What's your yeah. thoughts on that? Yeah, the, you're absolutely right. And we need challenges in life. Even even we think, oh my goodness, I really didn't need this. But like you say, you know, that formed me the person I am. I am a fighter. I really, I always say, never ever underestimate little people. I'm just 157, you know, but I can fight for my right. When it's my right, and I think, like, like you say, you see challenges as an opportunity, how you see it, what your attitude is towards those challenges, and also then making decisions. Making decisions. I said, yes, I can do it. Relationship within yourself. This is a very, very important one. Now, if you don't have a good relationship within yourself, how can you have a relationship with others? It's a rebel effect. And, yeah, and like absolutely. What, 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 what you say, because I was behind a wall, uh, 3.6 meter high and 155 kilometers long. So did I want to live like this? Or was it, no, it's time for a change. Take on a challenge and transfer it in an opportunity. So I really want to ask some of our listeners, so well, reflect and, and ask yourself, do you live a life in prison or are you a prisoner in your own life? Go and take those, those two questions, go to your happy place and find those answers. Do you live a life in prison or are you a prisoner in your own life? Find those answers. It can make a huge difference to your life. Life is too short. That's a really powerful uh, way of looking at things, right? And, and it's certainly born, again, by the experiences that you're, you've had and you're, you're shaping lives. You're shaping lives behind bars um, now. And, you know, in an interesting way, you shaped your own life behind bars <laughs> with, the, yes. uh, with the wall in, in East Germany. Uh, and, but you're taking those experiences and, and doing it in a different fashion here for with some of the more disadvantaged people um, that we have whose, uh, whose life experiences have led them into paths where uh, uh, they've, they've 
obviously moved into law enforcement and as a consequence are now behind bars um, for some some for some significant crime and some for, uh, for a significant amount of time um and i'm interested to to delve into that um shortly but um uh, tell me tell me more about the experience of coming into new zealand how did that process happen for you and what was the uh, what, what some what, was, what were the, some of the things you had to overcome in that uh, process yeah yeah can i can i quickly go back and to the East Germany when we actually got the letter. Can I? Yes, yeah, absolutely. Oh, please, please. Yep. New Zealand. There's, because then on the day when, when we got the final permission to leave, so for the next day, then the train left at seven minutes past 10. But before, you know, we all, because it was my daughter's birthday, so we were all together. We had lots of cars, went to the, to the um, train station. Then we drank bubbles out of paper cups. We we hugged, we kissed, and we had no idea if we would see each other again. Just look at it. Even 30, 32 years later, you had no idea. Do you see your family, your friends again? But we were determined for a better life for our family. And sometimes you have to make decisions like this. Even if people, some people, they live in a relationship, they are not happy at all. But then think about yourself. It is worth to make the change and take on the challenges to see those new opportunities. So we left night, and after a long train ride, we saw house, houses and white, white houses and lights. So the difference between East and West Germany was so obvious. It was <laughs> just crazy. So we arrived at six o'clock in the pouring rain and the winter cold in West Germany. It was on the 29th of November 1988 on my daughter's this year 36th birthday. So safe to the third new man. So and arriving there and then you see a fruit and veggie stall at the train station and or oranges, bananas. But not for us. We couldn't buy it because we were not allowed to take any money with us. So Only you 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 left East Germany with zero. Yes, we yeah officially officially with zero. We were yep. not allowed to take any money with us because we had uh, the East German money, and we are not we were not allowed to have West German currency. Not allowed at all. So we arrived there with nothing. We did something. I can say it now because they can't put me in the jail now. So we had a five hundred dollar note. We had five hundred dollar West note between the seats between the seats if they would check us honestly we were sitting there if they would come in and check the entire cabin yep. we would go to jail and sally would have gone to foster care so we sometimes in life you have to risk something <laughs> yeah <laughs> but then then when we arrived we were escorted from the red cross to a refugee camp where we stayed for three days we were asked humorous questions and everything you know they wanted to know for three days and then we received 150 150 marks yeah with german marks passion so belief determination we were determined to make it work and we did that's a phenomenally inspirational story and i and i and i'm, I'm I, I feel the inspi inspiration from that uh, is it's overcoming the odds, uh, you know, and going through that process of, of confusion, because you don't know necessarily what's going to happen. And you don't know for a fact that they're actually allowing you out of the country. Mm -hmm. You could, mm -hmm. you could they, it could be uh, a train to somewhere else. You don't, you don't know. Um, and, but you have to trust that, that this is the, the way that you are moving forward. So once you're in West Germany, uh, why, why New is, Zealand? That's, why that's why New Zealand? Yeah, yeah, wait, wait, yeah, yeah. I know you want to go. I'll be, I'll be good at this. That is what, what happened then, three months later. So my brother was still in Germany, and the government, the government wanted to make sure he wouldn't think of leaving as well. So they gave him a very, very hard time to make sure he wouldn't leave. So after living four months in West Germany. I had this feeling that something was wrong. 
So I had to ring my mom at work, even though it was she could lose her job as a kindergarten teacher. But, you know, sometimes, you know, there is something wrong. Yep. Even 500 kilometers away, I was right. My brother, he tried to commit suicide. He was in hospital for a month and the government was sure he wouldn't leave the country anymore. Yeah. 31 years later, he's coping all right, living in a special home for brain damage. Yeah. You know, that's, so, so that's so, so very sad to hear. I'm so very sorry to hear that, um, Steph. Yeah, and look, it's it's still it still makes me emotional. It's just, this live every day, live really, it's just live life. You don't know what is around the corner. No. Yeah, and back to your question. You know, eight years later, so we went on holiday to New Zealand. So why? Lots of people ask me, Stephanie, why holiday? Why why New Zealand? Okay, we go to New Zealand. <laughs> 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 yeah. So, and so from that, we, so, but, we, so that from that time, so you arrived, you arrived into uh, in New Zealand on holiday. Um, so what? You know, uh, 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 all of our community, the vast majority of our community, have arrived here from somewhere else, and it's been a very different roads and, and different ways of getting here. Um, uh, very swiftly, how how long was the process from deciding to immigrate here and actually getting here to New Zealand? Nine months. Nine months, that's swift. That's a very swift I, process. That's me, I'm a doer. I'm a doer. If I decide something, my gut feeling me say, just do it, passion, belief, determination, heck yeah. No, we went on holidays Christmas, Christmas in 95, and the place, the people, the weather, it's just paradise. And we thought, you know what? We could move to New Zealand. And at the same time, I was made redundant at work. But I said, oh, yeah, this is great. <laughs> this is the reason, you know? It's sometimes people, they are really upset when they're made redundant, especially now so many people are made redundant. See the good side out of it. See the positive side of it. Don't waste energy on negativity and feel sorry for yourself. No, there was a reason because... 95% honestly, Greg, of people, they were not happy with the job anymore. <laughs> Universe took over and said, hey, you know what? It's time for a change. Take on the challenge. There is another opportunity for you outside. So arriving into New Zealand, obviously you, you've moved again, you've uprooted your life. You've now come, come to New Zealand. Um, but you had, uh, that wasn't the end of your struggles at that point there. So, so tell me a little bit about the some of the. Yeah. So coming coming to New Zealand, we didn't have a visa. We didn't know where to go, and I couldn't speak the language because I learned Russian at school. The only sentence I could say, my name is Steffi, and the first sentence I learned from the Kiwis, Steffi, take it easy. <laughs> <laughs> and then the cars drive on the other side of the road. The steering wheel is on the other side of the car. You know, when I had to go to Auckland, I studied the map to make sure I know where to go and I wouldn't end up on the other side of the road. This is all little things, little, little things, but it yep. adds up. My son comes from, from kindergarten, Max. Go ahead, another edition. So Max comes from kindergarten and mom, they speak a different German because at home we spoke German. So when we came over, Max was almost two. And Sally was almost 12. So. <laughs> they speak a different German. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's such a lovely thing. That's a, it's such a, 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 a child's view of yeah. the world and how, how things work. Um, I would like, I really want to um, move, I'm sort of thinking of uh, uh, time is, is disappearing on us here. Um, and uh, I would love it if we have uh, any uh, uh feedback from our audiences um, around here on either on Facebook or on the uh, webinar itself. Um, would love to have some uh, uh, Q&A perhaps, uh, but we'll see how we go with that. What, what I'd really like to do is talk about the work that um, you're doing now, because you know, it's obviously been a, a long journey um, getting to the position you're in now. But the work that you do creates hope in uh, our prison community. 
Um, but it's not just the prisoners you're working with. Of course, it, it's, uh, it's, it's people outside of the prison service as well with uh, the, the speaking that you do too. But I'm really keen to know, how did you take this infectious positivity, which you are completely uh, full, uh, filled with, uh, and move into an area that I'd say the vast majority of us have no experience with, uh, preferably don't want to have experience with, but you've embraced this. So what drove you here? Uh, what's, the, what's the drivers and what are you doing within that service? So I was always fascinated with prison. I don't know why. I, I watch all prison movies. It's for me, watching those movies and seeing how they survive, that always reflected to me back, you know, living in East Germany, how we survived and how people survive in prison because it was, it was a similarity. With our war around, we were we yeah. were monitored. You know, we were restricted. We couldn't travel. We couldn't we couldn't do anything. Nothing. And I was I'm always fascinated with it. And I thought I really would love with my with my like you say with my positivity. And I'm my kids sometimes say I'm soaked in positivity, but it's fine. It's a good thing. And I know this from the inside out. I am here for a reason to make a difference. And then I decided one day, the universe talked to me and said, prison. I said, I'm not going into prison. I'm not robbing a bank or something. Prison, prison, on coaching, coaching. And I said, hold on a minute. I'm a coach. Yes. Why not? And I, I said, I'm a doer. So I said, okay, I did my homework. You know, what do you have? Police certificate and all those things. And I sent an email. I said, yeah, I want to work voluntarily in prison. I offered this and this uh, workshop. I would love to um, run a workshop there. Yes. I had no idea what to expect. They didn't have any idea what to expect. I'm loving it. Two years later, the difference I'm making in those, I call them my naughty boys, is amazing. Amazing. I love my work. Lots of people don't understand me why I'm doing it. But I think those guys made a mistake. We all make mistakes in our lives. They made a stupid one. And I tell them, they made a stupid one, they ended up there. But everybody in life deserves a second or even a third chance. And they definitely deserve it. That is so true. Um, I think one of the, uh, as you're talking, I I've done a bit of work with an organization called Pillars, um, which you may be familiar with. And Pillars is, a, is an organization dedicated to providing mentors, particularly uh, male and female, particularly male, uh, for children of prisoners. Mm -hmm. And one of the biggest issues with that is, and I think it's, it's a, something statistically, it's something along the lines of you are 12 times more likely to end up in prison if, you're, if you have a, a parent who is uh, also a prisoner. Um, I'm not sure about that stat, but it's, it's something around there. Uh, and so as an organization, Pillars does really great work in providing that role model uh, activity as a mentor uh, for, for uh, children. Um, and while you're on the inside, uh, try, uh, doing your best to uh, change mindsets. So thinking about our community we're talking to now, the migrant and ethnic community, Waitakere through to Northland, the work that you're doing in the prison service, how can we translate that the changing mindset outside, out here, during these times. Are we coming up towards Christmas? It is always uh, you know, a particularly challenging time for a lot of families because we've got a, a number of extra stresses going on there. Uh, uh, again, very similarly in a way to uh, the way that COVID changed the family structure. Christmas does that on a regular basis. We stop working. Um, at some point, the work closes down. We end up then spending significant amounts of time with each other, which can, in depending on your family situation, can either be really positive or it can increase the negative aspects in there. So what do we do? How do we use positivity and mindset to be able to change our situations here now? I think the, mo the really most important thing is to appreciate relationships. Very important. The first one I said before, your own relationship. Find your, find your own goals, what you want to do, what you really want in life. What do you really want in life? Ask you this question. Relationship with others, with your loved ones, 
that's because this is what I get from the inside. There's now they're realizing how much they love their children and how much they miss the children and even even their moms as well because they are really young ones in there. So the relationship, the love, and see everything in life for the for I have to say for some of say to the universe, thank you so much. I am in here because this is my chance to turn my life around. This is my second chance and I should grab it with both hands. And this is what I, if I can plant one little seed. We can make a huge, huge difference in the 60% reoffending in New Zealand. Huge difference. Wow, 60% reoffending. So you know, if we if we look at it from a look at it from a rehabilitation point of view, are we realistically are we actually rehabilitating our prison community, um, or are we using it as a punitive uh, a method of, of you know, vengeance? I suppose in terms of community. I don't want to be too political because you're not going in there. Uh, what I really have to say, because everything what we do comes from the inside. What we think, it's what we feel. Everything from the inside. And I believe if we can change the person from the inside out, not from the outside in, we need to know what those guys need, how we can help them to survive once they walk through those gates again and not going back. This is the most important thing to work with them. And this is what I do. I, 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 I listen to them. And this is what the guy said the other week. He said, Miss, you know what? You really listen to us and you don't treat us like a prisoner. You know, I, I, they are humans and they made a mistake, but everybody can learn from it. And for them having the second chance, they say, should say, thank you so much. I will use this second chance. And when you have guys, you know, and I say, oh, I'm so proud of you, what you just did. And, and the guy, this, honestly, it breaks my heart. But I know I reached him somewhere deep, you know? And, and this is, we have to work, everything is from the inside out. And I have to say, I love this work. I like making a difference in there. And I know I make a difference. And this is what I say to the guys, passion, belief, determination. I'm passionate about to make a difference. I believe I can make a difference and I'm determined to make a difference. Oh, that's beautiful. I mean, those, those, those uh, elements there, you know, um, with, with, uh, passion, belief, determination. They're really simple, but mm -hmm. they have so much power um, depending on, on how much focus you put on them. And it's really, it really is finding, finding what you are passionate about um, yeah. and, and believing that you can achieve it and being really determined to, to do it. In fact, the biggest, probably the biggest part of that really is the determination part, right? Because that's the piece that you've got to get up each day and do the work. No matter what it is that you want to achieve, you have to focus on it and you have to make sure that you are doing every step along the way. Um, it reminds me that just as you spoke, reminded me of some of the experiences I've had where I've decided that I'm going to create, I'm going to get a goal, I'm going to set a goal, and I'm going to do everything I can to move towards that goal. Now, some of the, sometimes that's really challenging and uh, because you're, you don't have the same mood you don't have the same emotional state every single day no matter what you're doing uh, so that process is all about the determination how much do you want that goal how much are you willing to work on it to achieve it uh, and and these times of uh, uh, of lockdowns of uh, uh, of worry in terms of what may or may not happen and i think this is this is certainly over the course of this year right we we locked down in in march We've moved through towards the end of this year. And then in August, or July, August, we had that second lockdown. Now that changed a lot of people's mental roadmap. Uh, we, we, people, and I certainly I've had uh, a number of conversations with a wide range of uh, people about what it did for them. But it was a, quite a mental 
bump uh, mm -hmm. and put people into a quite a negative state. Uh, was that something that happened for you? Did you feel that too, or did you see that happening around you? Like I said, I'm I'm a little bit soaked in positivity, and as you know, I had a my biggest challenge last year. I'm working through, but then listen to yourself. Listen to your self talk. I think this is so so important. People wake up in the morning and they're straight away negative. You know, but if you say, oh my goodness, yeah, it's a nice day and see something positive straight away, really shower yourself with positivity in the morning when you go in your shower and carry this one all day long. And like being in lockdown, as you know, I've been by myself and I had some tough times, but what did I do? I, you know, you have that your attitude, how you see your challenge, you give up or you get up, give up. It's not an option. We get up. And for me, exercise. Exercise is my, if I feel like I'm overwhelmed or I have too much to do, oh, I go for a bike ride. Quickly, I go for my run, go for a walk. That helps you to get out, get away from it and listen, listen to yourself, how you talk to yourself. Because if you talk to yourself and you talk still in the past, you know, always in the past, then you, you have most. the worries and the anxiety kicks in. But if you live in the now, in the present, and you, everything is triggered with your thoughts, what you think in, in this certain moment, live the life like this, it makes life much easier. It's not done overnight, but if you work on it and really listen and sit, listen to your thoughts, it's like, oh my goodness, I this thought from the past triggered my feeling right now it was just a thought in this moment live in the now that can make it is not and they absolutely fascinating actually how it works they can do it now it's i always find it amazing the human mind is an incredibly amazing thing and yeah. it seems to be so changeable so uh very very and if we allow it to be uh, and one of the things that, that i've come across throughout my travels and my life has been that uh, we can't choose what happens to us but we can choose our reaction to that situation right yeah uh, in, right. In every single way uh, and i'm always reminded of that that process of you're driving a car you're driving a car down a road and then someone a, a, a bad driver of course because none of us are bad drivers um, a bad driver cuts you off. Now, you can do a few different things about that. You can get angry and chase them down the road because, uh, you know, they, how dare they cut you off. Uh, you can uh, um, do nothing or you can simply go, well, that person might have had a need to be going faster than I was. Yeah. Uh, and perhaps that, that uh, I'll just give them a little bit of leeway because you never know what experiences they've just had. They don't know what, you don't know what, at what stage of life they're going through as well. So you can either choose to react negatively or you can choose from a positive um, uh, mm -hmm. standpoint. There's another, quick, there's another good example of what you just said. There's, you know, you're driving behind a car and your car is running out of petrol. Would you blame the car in front of you? No. It's your, it's your fault. You know, lots of people blame things from the outside, but then you think, like, no, because I didn't went to the petrol station. No, this is nothing outside. It's everything. It's it's within you. It's just your thinking and everything. So why why should I stress out about other other people, other situations? Like you say, you know how you see things with your eyes. It's everything. And take on the challenges. I really want people that listen to this get addicted to challenges. Take them on and transform them into opportunities in every challenge. I really have to say in every challenge is an opportunity for something better, makes us stronger to go through and build more resilience in every challenge. And Craig, you know it. Oh, yes, <laughs> without a doubt. Uh, life throws up its challenges and how you deal with those challenges is the mark of how you travel through uh, life itself. Um, well, I'm certainly hoping that uh, this talk, this, uh, this sharing of ideas, uh, gives us our community that we're going out to 
some further options, some further thought processes about how they uh, can go through in their own lives and look at the elements of positivity. Um, and I've said this before, but I'll say it again. I love this thing about these sharing of ideas, right? Ideas are brilliant because yeah. we have that. Uh, George Bernard Shaw said this, and I, and I always quote him, that if you have an apple, Steffi, and I have an apple, I, I give you my apple, you give me your apple. We still only have one apple each, right? But if I have an idea and you have an idea and we swap ideas, we both now have two ideas. Yeah. That's the beauty. That's the beauty yeah. of the, the process of sharing ideas. And if we can continue that process on, um, we'll turn to another person with those two ideas and share our two with them and they'll share their two with us and we'll continue on and build and build and build from there. Um, and that's a beautiful thing because it's with ideas that we change communities. Um, and I'm, I'm loving having you here on this show because um, your positivity and your very simple but very profound concepts uh, are, are integral to being able to spark ideas in other people. Oh, thank you. But it's really, it's like, like, what, like what you said, I want people to really, to break through, to break out. You know, listen to themselves and and make the changes because we are all in the driver's seat. Nobody else can drive our car. We are so you know what I mean. But we are in the driver's seat. This is our decisions and live life to the full, really, every day. And like Albert Einstein said, you know, we have to make mistakes. So it don't yes. end up in prison, you know. <laughs> but we have to make some kind of mistake. What else we going to do? <laughs> That, that, that's the way. No, that's right. That's right. Because if you, if you did something once and it was successful, you would just keep doing it over and over again and nothing would change because you yeah. are not risking. You're not taking opportunity where, where, where you may fail. And failures are really the, are one of those big things. If, you, you know, without failure, there's no innovation. Uh, Edison's yeah. uh, attempt to create the light bulb uh, was born of over a thousand failures, but he never said that he was actually a failure he just said i've learned a thousand ways not to make a light bulb yeah. um and we, and, yeah you say. Uh, and that's the reality it's like every single thing is just a learning experience yeah if you can look up you can get up everything you know so I, very I, very I like, true I, I, I like this saying yeah yeah no so i really want Whatever who is watching this, hi, hey, you know, you can do it. And and also what you said before, we have sharing. Talk to others. Talk. Don't bottle stuff in. Talk. If you have any problems or you're even, you know, you have something, it, it it bothers you for such a long time. There is always someone out there who will listen and help you. There is hope for everyone. Everyone. And I re and with this COVID, there yeah, I heard lots of things. What happened and one of our friends you know committed suicide and it's it, it breaks your heart you know he didn't talk 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 and it, it goes a little bit great to men men women talk more but men yes. they just bottle everything in they they don't talk and but this is what i try working with those naughty guys they open up and i tell them i don't want it when any kaka in the room i don't want what they think I want to hear, I want to hear what comes from here. Nothing else. I wanted to open up, and this is what, how we can help each other. The same with your apple. Wait, the same with your apple. To help each other, listen, help, support. It's all, we are an amazing community, actually, in New Zealand. It's five million people. It's beautiful. We are lucky, I quit. We're extremely lucky. I mean, this is the this is the beautiful thing is that is that I didn't choose to immigrate to New Zealand. I came because my family, uh, my mum and dad, made that choice yeah. uh, to yeah. come to this country, uh, and that was born of a situation of they, they they saw it as being a better life. Their their life in England was very challenged. Uh, they lived in the north of England. It was a not very little work, no real opportunities, and they saw New Zealand as a great hope. We arrived into this country with, with very little. The, uh, the cost was borne by the New Zealand government by, uh, for us. We were the last flight of the 10-pound poms, what was the scheme was called. So we oh came into this goodness. country. My mum and dad were 10 pounds each. Arrived in this country, children free, 
and dad was uh, working for a company for two years. So he had a, a return of service that he had to do for two years. And at the end of the two years, he quit that job, started his own uh, painting and decorating business, never worked for anyone else apart from himself uh, for uh, uh, for the rest of his life. And uh, now uh, uh, makes um, uh, beautiful crafts and wooden furniture, which he did throughout his life as well. Um, but, uh, through his working life as well, but uh, he, he, you know, that that whole process of coming to a country and then making it, and the example that my parents showed me in that process of being immigrants was hard work, because there's no choice. You're here, you have to make it work. There's no going back. You're 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 here for good, and so I think what we tend to find is that as immigrants, we have a great deal of resilience because we have to. We must work. We must find a way, uh, because the alternative is to not survive, and mm -hmm. we're just not going to go down down that track. So, mm -hmm. well, I noticed we're coming uh, uh, towards the close of our uh, session here, and uh, I, you know, I love talking with you, Steffi. And so, I, I, for our audience, um, Steffi is on the board of uh, the Professional Speakers Association of New Zealand. I'm the president of the. Professional Speakers Association of New Zealand, and we get to um, interact on a very regular basis uh, uh, around the aspects of professional speaking in uh, here and also overseas. Um, and through that, we get to share our experiences like this, where we talk about our work and we talk about the things that we see working for our communities. Uh, and I love this uh, because, again, it gives me different points of view and it gives Steffi different points of view and it gives our audience different points of view as well uh, and it's not that we're always agreeing because if we were always agreeing then we wouldn't be failing <laughs> and we need to fail as well yes, um, yes. across the board um, so you have some uh, uh, you have a, a boot camp coming up that um, uh, maybe you can tell us a little bit about that yeah, that's right. This is a Resilience Bootcamp. It's called Resilience Bootcamp 2021 Breakthrough to Break Out. This is different. You can have uh, five, five hours, 10 hours, or three months. We're doing one in one sessions. I really want to help you to live the life you deserve and you always wanted. And to actually find out if you live a life in prison or if you're a prisoner in your own life. This is, this is, I love, I love really to question people and i for myself i'm the challenge coach i love to challenge people so if you are a fine mate and is that oh no i don't like challenges then you are the right person i want to work with i need those people they go people they're going to challenge me then i can challenge them for a better life love it love it so that's coming up you can go to my webpage uh, steffiaugust.com all the info is on there Cool. So steffiaugust.com, uh, and that will give you the uh, information there for the boot camp. Is it something that people need to go to, or is, is this, can this be done online? What's the process there? Yes. So we uh, we can we can do Zoom Zoom. Thanks to the technology, we can do the Zoom um, using Zoom technology. All the people here at Chawanga Mount, we can do it in one on one sessions. So they it's up to up to everyone. So I could we can do it anywhere and everywhere. Definitely, definitely. It's better in one-on-one, -on -one, but I, I'm happy Zoom works, you know. I still can challenge you on Zoom, trust me. Never underestimate little people. And can, <laughs> <laughs> can I ask, can I ask like, like I like I said to you, Craig, I'm a doer. And yes. I started on the 4th of August with my own YouTube channel. So people sharing their stories in a, in a talk show, talk show base in my studio. So they coming actually to the studio. It's not online. It's in real. You know what I mean? Real life, so, actual people, in, real people real in a physical space. That's, yes. that's pretty and, novel. <laughs> yes, and that's what I say. So my topic is it's time to talk. So it's time to talk real people, real lives. So this is us. And we had Todd Miller here. We had Jen Tinetti here. We had some really very interesting people sharing their stories. Um, amazing. Like with you, Greg, what you do. They are so inspirational. And even you, it's not your story, but you still can take out the positivity, the inspiration, and the final kick to make a decision. You know, it doesn't have to be your story. 
but get the energy out of out of this world. Say, yeah, I can do this, and I'm going to do this. So if somebody wants to share the stories so it's in Tawanga, please say you're very welcome. We can organize a little talk show chat and you're on camera. Easy as. Just that, do it. That's a beautiful thing. And and I think that's a that's a really cool thing to do as well, because we we you know we often talk about this with with our communities, particularly uh, migrant and ethnic communities, uh, what we tend to do, and this is very normal, we move to a new country. And when we arrive in that new country, what we tend to do is gravitate towards our own community. And that's normal, absolutely normal, because we go with, with what's familiar. And we go with the experience and the culture that we've grown up with or we, we know. Uh, but the, there can be a challenge in that. The tendency is, is to remain insular to become an island within the cultures of your own country or the chosen yeah. country. Uh, and something like this, where you're challenging yourself to break out of your own comfort zone, to break out of the, of the restrictions that you place upon yourself is a very powerful thing and can make some significant change. So, I, you know, I really appreciate you being here on the show, Steffi, and, uh, and on this particular episode, the final episode of, moments that matter um and i know that you've been a great proponent for this particular show and for me and for the work that i've been doing um as well uh, and i've really appreciated your support uh particularly in those moments where we've had um some technical technical challenges i think is probably the best way to describe those yeah um, but you but had I... the opportunity to learn more and more and more your breakthrough to break out <laughs> <laughs> that's exactly right um and so uh you know as we and we we all know i think for all of us who have been working on some kind of virtual platform over the course of this year that nothing runs smooth there's nothing that realistically uh, uh seems to work 100 percent of the time uh at, at 100 percent of its um uh quality level there's but what we tend what we try and do is we try and do our best to be able to provide that uh, platform and to provide the experience that we really want our audiences to have. Uh, and I think that's what we've really done over the course of the six weeks. And, um, and, and what's, what's been some of your, as you've been thinking about what we've done today, but also over the course of this last six weeks, what you have seen, what is your overall feel of what we're providing for our community here? And what can we, uh, from this point, what could we potentially do more for our migrant and ethnic community? I think it's absolutely fantastic. It's an amazing message, what you what you just said before. And also what I, I say, that you don't have to have the same story, but you can, if you listen carefully, you can take things out of those stories. The inspiration, you know, if you have a, a, a day where you feel a little bit down, switch on and, and have a look and listen to the stories again. It will really boost you up. It will give you ideas. And having this positivity, you know, that makes life much, much easier. And seeing challenges as opportunities is a must. And this is, listen to this, and Greg, you did an amazing job. I watched all the stories all every week. Absolutely fantastic. And I know that was for you also a new challenge, new but an amazing opportunity. And I know you're going to do more and more. And I can't wait to see all your new opportunities coming up soon. Now, definitely, def, def, definitely watch this. You, everybody can benefit from every story each week. Totally different, but you can take something out of every story. Well, Steffi, I gotta say, thank you very, very much for uh, joining us here on the show. It's been a pleasure to have you on here and also in the lead up uh, as we've been discussing and when you're talking about your journey, your story, and the work that uh, you do for uh, our various different communities. It's been a, 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 a wonderful um, hour and a quarter um, sitting here with you in this oh, really? studio. I know, it just goes like time oh, just disappears goodness. really swiftly in this environment. <laughs> <laughs> but I really appreciate it um, and I wish you all the very best for the work that you're doing uh, into the future and also uh, just to, uh, to say uh, that if you want to get hold of um, Steffi with a boot camp um, then uh, um is the uh, website to go to and uh, you'll be able to connect uh, as well so there's some, obviously some wonderful opportunities there for the future Steffi, once again Thank you so much, and I look forward to connecting with you 
as we uh, uh, head into the future as well. All the best. Awesome. Thank you so much. Keep up the good work. Okay, have a lovely day. Take on the challenges. Bye. And that was Steffi August joining us here in the studio as we come to a close of our final episode of this, the Moments That Matter series brought to you by the Waitakere Ethnic Board uh, and also with the great support of Foundation North and the Aotearoa Academy. Really appreciate that. I mean, uh, please do uh, take a moment if you would like to review, go on through. You'll have access to these uh, recordings um, over time. And uh, what we will be doing is uh, providing uh, some links to those via the uh, Waitakere Ethnic Board at the appropriate moment as well. So what I'd like to do is round it out. Um, my name is Greg Ward. It's been my absolute pleasure to be here as your host over the course of this last six weeks. And I certainly hope to be able to bring you more of these over time as well. Uh, so we started out as I did with a mihi whakato, and it's only appropriate we close here with the whara aki. So uh, apu te hono, tātou hono. Rātou te hunga mate, kia rātou. Tātou te hunga ora, kia tātou. Nō reira, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā rā koutou, katoa. All the very best. Keep your spirits up. We will see you. All the best for our communities. See you soon.